This is Andy Orm. I'm here in the exhibition hall at OSCON, and I'm talking today with Kathleen Ting from Cloudera. Kathleen's job is to help customers with really big jobs keep them up and running. I understand that a lot of jobs fail through misconfigurations and problems. Definitely. We've analyzed our support tickets over the past several years and discovered that an overwhelming number of them, 44 percent, actually mm -hmm. are due to misconfigurations. And we're not, we're not talking about small trivia issues. We're talking about support tickets that come in because um, the system went down. So these are critical production issues. And when we look at the root cause, we're able to trace it down to what, in hindsight, seems to be a very simple, very trivial misconfiguration. But you know, obviously, in the heat of the moment, um, it's hard to make that correlation between the first overt symptom and the ultimate root cause of a, root, of a misconfiguration. So I understand that today you were talking a lot about Zookeeper, and, mm -hmm. and it's hard to sort of characterize what Zookeeper does, but can you tell us how Zookeeper fits in with what you're doing with Hadoop? Sure, that's a great question. Zookeeper is what I classify as an unsung hero, because you don't notice Zookeeper until it goes down. And when Zookeeper is doing its job, it's business as usual. So um, people often call Zookeeper the canary in the Hadoop coal mine. Mm -hmm. And when you start seeing warnings from um, from Zookeeper, much like when the canary passes out, you know that um, there's something worse coming your way. You better get out. And so same thing, when you start seeing Zookeeper errors, it doesn't necessarily mean that your Zookeeper is having issues. It usually means that somewhere in the stack, since Zookeeper is a coordinator for all of your distributed systems, it means that either the network or the underlying OS or the hardware um, or the clients that Zookeeper is coordinating something is amiss there. And when you're seeing these error messages, um, it's not necessarily you need to go look at Zookeeper, you need to look at the clients that Zookeeper's coordinating and figure out what's wrong. Could there be clients that just aren't terminating or some other sort of? Definitely. Um, one of our most common um, issues that we've seen is, is um, you know, there might be leaky clients, so they're not closing out connections. And as, as a result, um, Zookeeper will warn you that, you know, there are too many connections, um, you know, you could, easily increase that setting, but it's a protective setting on Zookeeper's side because um, you know, it wants to make sure that these leaky clients are closing under connections. They wanted to prevent denial of service attacks, et cetera. So you also, uh, in this Hadoop universe that you're uh, monitoring there, you've also become an expert on Scoop. Mm -hmm. So um, tell us what uh, sort of things people use that for. So Scoop, what I, I like to term it as is it's, it's a gateway tool to Hadoop. So when you want to, when you first start with Hadoop, you probably already have your data somewhere, um, most likely in a relational database, MySQL, Oracle, Teradata, Netiza, et cetera. And how do you get that data into Hadoop? And that's where Scoop comes into play. Scoop is a data transfer tool, a bulk data transfer tool for transferring your data from your relational database. Actually, not just a relational database. It works for Couchbase, too, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so any sort of structured data store will work. Um, you can transfer your data from that um, external source, usually a database, into Hadoop for processing. That way you can have all of your structured data from your database, along with your unstructured data ready in Hadoop, analyze it all together so you can profit from all your data and then, if you want to, you can export the results back into your database later. Now, is this a concession to legacy systems, or is it because relational databases are still awesome? I would say it's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we we don't see we don't see Scoop, we don't see um, Hive, HBase, Hadoop, etc. We don't see these um, as competitors to the legacy databases, but rather as complements. So databases will always be very good for structured data. Uh, not so much for unstructured data. That's what Hadoop is for. It's meant for unstructured data. And so Scoop is really an enabler so that you can profit from both your structured data and from your unstructured data. Um, see correlations that you might not have been able to see before if you were just using a relational database. I'd like to return for a moment to Zookeeper. What do you think are the most important things people should learn about Zookeeper, considering it is sort of a, um, an extra uh, auxiliary tool? Zookeeper, I would say, the, what I want people to walk away with is that Zookeeper is not for storage. 
I, I think a lot of people run into issues with Zookeeper when they start using it as storage because Zookeeper has um, has a has a file system model, um, very much like the Unix file system model. Um, and so I think people start thinking, well, we can start storing data, but Zookeeper is meant for um, for only storing location data, you know, data about where the other Z nodes are. It's not really meant for for data storage. Um, and so I think if if people walk away thinking that Zookeeper is meant for coordination, um, it's meant for reliability, for availability, rather than storage, I think they'll um, you know, prevent a lot of issues that way. So you store state in Zookeeper, exactly. but not your real data. Exactly. Do you want to say anything else during our little interview? I started in Hadoop, see, about two and a half years ago, mm -hmm. uh, coming straight from the mainframe, actually, mm -hmm. and you know, when I when I interviewed at Cloudera, what I said was, I want to get involved with Hadoop because I see it as the next mainframe. Um, and at that point, I didn't really know that much about Hadoop. But two and a half years later, um, you know, what I thought then still rings true. You know, I, I see Hadoop as a great equalizer. We're doing all that great batch processing instead of on expensive hardware. We're now doing it on commodity hardware. Um, and and I think Hadoop really epitomizes um, the open source model of. Um, you know, anyone, anywhere. I have coworkers who hail from um, countries across the world, uh, and they got involved with Hadoop first, and then they joined Cloudera. And I just think it's it's a testament um, to the Apache Software Foundation and to open source to enable that. Interestingly, MapReduce is a very specific algorithm, or you might call it a family of algorithms. But somehow Hadoop has sort of taken off in the press as the big data. Um, it's, it's the icon, it's the thing people talk about, synonymous with big data in a way. I, I think we, we owe that a lot to the white papers that Google published on MapReduce that mm -hmm. enabled Doug Cutting to write Hadoop. Um, I, I think you know, one reason Hadoop has really gone mainstream rather than MapReduce, um, you know, again, thanks to Google, which filed a patent, hasn't enforced that patent, um, but I, I think companies um, like Cloudera, um, like Hortonworks, like MapR, um, who are providing support and services for Hadoop um, and making it available to, to everyone. We have, we have training at Cloudera, we offer training, we offer support, we offer services, so you can go from not knowing how to spell Hadoop to mm -hmm. standing up a Hadoop cluster in production. Yes. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Andy.